So guys, we had a very interesting September in the hair loss community. You might have already heard about the new hair growth helmet that is being launched from a big player. And I mean, very big. But there were also some other interesting developments that have flown under the radar. And you probably didn't hear about them until today, coming right up. So guys, just before we get into the September hair loss updates, if you want to get access to the hair nutrition plan, then make sure to click the link in the description. You get 21 delicious recipes designed specifically for faster, stronger hair growth. The meals are loaded with nutrients like biotin, zinc, and collagen to make hair as thick and strong as possible. So we're gonna start things off with some very exciting news. LG, the electronics giant from South Korea, is entering the hair loss market. This past month, we got the first report of LG's full-size hair growth helmet. The helmet is designed to treat pattern hair loss and features a combination of 146 lasers as well as 104 LED lights. According to LG, Korean research participants showed increased hair growth and thickness after using the helmet for a total of 16 weeks, three times per week. We don't have an exact release date yet, nor a price. But, according to the news reports, it will be on the market by the end of 2020. And judging by the cost of similar devices in this class, we expect a price tag between 500 to 1,000 US dollars. Guys, we have loads of laser hair growth helmets on the market right now, but none by a company even remotely as big as LG. So this could be great news for consumers and will no doubt help raise awareness and legitimize this form of hair loss treatment in the general public. Guys, are you excited about the LG helmet? And is it something that you would consider purchasing? Let us know in the comment section below. So guys, as we mentioned last month, August is Hair Loss Awareness Month. Well, September is a bit more specific than that, having been designated as Alopecia Areata Awareness Month. Alopecia Areata is an autoimmune type of hair loss that affects both men and women. Its hallmark is the development of completely bold patches on the head. Though these are often confined to the scalp, they can eventually spread to other parts of the face and body. And in rare cases, every single hair of the body can fall off. Its onset is typically sudden and it generally has a better prognosis than pattern hair loss, meaning you are more likely to see a complete reversal of the condition and the restoration of a full head of hair. For some people, unfortunately, the hair loss does not reverse. When this happens, the condition becomes chronic and the person will often go on to have it for the rest of their lives. According to the National Institute of Healthcare Excellence in the UK, around 15 out of every 10,000 people have this condition. So we've talked a lot in the past about the importance of lifestyle factors when it comes to hair loss. And most of the time, we've touched on the link between diet, hair loss, and some very other important health conditions, including heart disease and metabolic syndrome. You can check out our past videos where we've explored this topic in detail. In a nutshell, hair loss in men, especially early onset hair loss, has been linked to an increased risk of heart disease and metabolic syndrome, which are presumably strongly related to a low quality diet, which typically consists of high glycemic index, low micronutrient density foods. In other words, junk food. Well, another lifestyle villain with a well-known link to heart disease is smoking. Smoking is probably the number one preventable cause of heart disease worldwide. And just a few days ago, we had the publication of another study suggesting it can also be linked to male pattern hair loss. The study was out of Egypt and looked at 1,000 healthy males, aged between 20 and 35. 500 of them smoked at least 10 cigarettes a day and were classed as smokers. The remaining 500 were non-smokers. All these men were recruited after having attended a dermatology clinic. So this was a cross-sectional study basically a snapshot in time. And as such, it's difficult to ascribe causation with any degree of certainty. But still, what was reported is impressive. Fully 85% of the smoker group had some degree of male pattern hair loss. This is a shockingly high percentage considering the average age was 26 years old. Most of these men, almost 50%, had a grade three, while about a quarter had a grade four. In contrast, the corresponding percentage for the non-smokers was 40%. So you have a pretty massive difference here. 85% of these young smokers had some degree of hair loss compared to only 40% for the non-smokers. Needless to say, this was a highly statistically significant difference. Now, as I said, this is a cross-sectional study, so not exactly the strongest evidence, but nevertheless, it was still very impressive. 
Now, there were two things that did concern me about this study. Firstly, the fact that the sample was in neat 500 men in either group. In scientific research, you rarely see these kind of rounded numbers for a couple of reasons. Firstly, what you're aiming for is an adequate sample size to show statistically significant differences. And this adequate sample size is very rarely a round number, like 500 or 1000. The second reason you rarely get these kind of rounded figures has to do with the practical realities of research. For example, in this study, we would expect either smokers or non-smokers to be more common in the population. So by the time that there were 500 participants in one group, you would have fewer in the other group. And it's unlikely that you'd stop recruiting from the first group and just continue to recruit till you hit 500 in the second group as well. That would just needlessly restrict the overall sample size and lower the statistical power of your study. Another thing that concerned me a bit was the extent of the difference. Sure, you'd expect to see a difference between the two groups, but 85% versus 40% is far, far larger than what you'd expect. From the research we've seen in the past, I would have expected maybe a 5 to 10% difference between the two groups. 45% is just massive. Guys, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think this study is onto something? Or should we take the results with a grain of salt? Let us know down in the comments below. Whatever the case, this was not the first study to report a link between smoking and androgenetic alopecia. As we've reported in past videos, there are a growing number of studies implicating smoking in hair loss, as well as premature graying of the hair. This research will no doubt be of direct interest to many of you guys out there who do smoke, and will bring you further research on this topic as soon as it comes out. So guys, there are a few things that get me as excited as a fresh microneedling study. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, you already know this. Microneedling, in combination with a topical stimulant, is simply one of the best ways to reverse hair loss. We started getting the first studies 5 to 10 years ago, but in the last couple of years, the pace has been really picking up. We've probably had as many papers in this time as in all the previous years combined. So in this latest study, we actually got answers to one of the most common questions. What is the optimal needle size? We've had studies that got fantastic results with the needle sizes ranging from 0.5 all the way up to 1.5 millimeters. So in this particular study, the researchers used an electrical microneedling pen device, which had two adjustable needle lengths, 0.6 and 1.2 millimeters. A total of 60 men and women with pattern hair loss were recruited. They were randomly split into three groups of 20 each. All three groups used topical 5% minoxidil twice daily, but one combined it with microneedling using the 1.2mm needles and another one with 0.6mm needles. The third group was a control group with no microneedling. Treatment in all groups lasted 12 weeks and the microneedling groups had a total of 6 sessions, so once every fortnight. Now, what were the results? Well, the 0.6mm depth was found to be slightly more effective than 1.2, though not by a lot. According to the authors, this slightly lower efficacy of the deeper needle length might have been down to the fact that it causes slight trauma to some of the hair follicles. The subjects in the 1.2mm group also reported more pain compared to the shallower 0.6 depth. As you'd expect, the control group got inferior results to either of the two microneedling groups. So fortunately for us, the authors of this study shared sample before and after photos from each microneedling group. Here you can see the before and afters of a man in the 1.2mm group and hear from another man in the 0.6mm group. Now, these are optimal candidates with a diffuse kind of hair loss all over the top of the head. And also, they have minimal recession of the temples. And there is noticeable regrowth in both of them. Guys, let us know if we missed any major stories from September. And guys, if you want to learn more about derma rolling or about the eight steps that Will use to reverse his own hair loss, then click the videos on the screen now.